All right, everyone, buckle up, because today we are diving deep into the world of cellular respiration. It's like exploring the power plant inside every single one of your cells. And we'll be using Chapter 9 from a biology textbook as our guide for this journey. We'll be uncovering how your body turns the food you eat into the energy that fuels, well, everything you do. It's amazing how much information this chapter covers, from the basics of energy flow to really complex processes like electron transport chains. This chapter lays the groundwork for understanding life at a molecular level. And remember that marmot we saw back in figure 9.1? Well, it turns out it's not just a cute furry face. It's a perfect example of how energy flows through ecosystems. That's right. It actually connects us all back to the power of the sun. Wow. So how does that work? Well, the marmot gets its energy from eating plants. Right. And those plants capture sunlight through photosynthesis. And guess what? The byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. Which is exactly what we need for cellular respiration. Exactly. It's this beautiful cycle. It really is. So let's break down how this energy magic happens, starting with catabolic pathways. Oh, I love catabolic pathways. I know it sounds complicated, but think of it like this. You have a big Lego structure, and you decide to take it apart. I like that analogy. You're basically breaking down these complex molecules to release energy. Exactly. And just like with Legos, you can use those individual pieces to build something new. These pathways allow us to get energy from food and use it to power our bodies. Okay, so how does this energy transfer actually happen? The textbook mentions something called redox reactions. Ah, yes. Redox reactions. They sound kind of intimidating. They might sound complex, but redox reactions are all about the transfer of electrons. Think of it like a game of hot potato. One molecule loses an electron and becomes oxidized, while another one gains an electron and becomes reduced. So it's not like this big explosion of energy, but more of a carefully planned handoff. Precisely. And a molecule called NAD plus plays a key role in this handoff. It acts like a tiny bus, picking up electrons and delivering them to the electron transport chain where they're used to make ATP. ATP, our cellular energy currency. Exactly. So NAD plus NA, a tiny bus with a big responsibility. I see how it all starts to connect now. Now, the textbook breaks down cellular respiration into three main stages glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and oxidative phosphorylation. Where do we even begin? Well, let's start with glycolysis, which takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell. It's ancient and very efficient, and get this, it doesn't even require oxygen. Wow, really? Yeah, picture this. You have a six-carbon sugar molecule called glucose, and you split it in half into two smaller molecules called pyruvate. That's glycolysis in a nutshell. So it's like a universal energy extraction method that happens in nearly every living organism. It is. It's fascinating. It really is. Yeah. But what happens to those pyruvate molecules after they're split? Well, if oxygen is present, they head to the mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell, and that's where pyruvate oxidation comes into play. Okay. In this process, pyruvate is converted into a molecule called acetyl-CoA, which is essential for the next stage. Acetyl-CoA. That <laughs> sounds important. It is. The textbook describes the next stage, the citric acid cycle, as a metabolic furnace. It's a great visual, isn't it? Yeah. It, yeah. This cycle is a series of chemical reactions that completely break down those remaining carbon atoms from glucose, releasing energy. That energy is then captured in the form of NADH and FADH2. So are NADH and FADH2 like upgraded versions of the NAD plus bus we talked about earlier? You could say that. They're loaded with high energy electrons ready to be delivered to the final stage of cellular respiration oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation. That's where the real AT production magic happens, right? That's right. Okay, bring on the grand finale. The textbook says that this happens in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, which is folded like a maze. Is there a reason for this complicated structure? Absolutely. This is where you find the electron transport chain, a series of protein complexes. Just picture them as a chain of waterfalls with electrons cascading down, releasing energy at each step. And this released energy is used to create a proton gradient. It's like pumping water uphill. But how does this gradient lead to ATP production? That's where another amazing enzyme, ATP synthase, comes in. It's embedded in the membrane and acts like a tiny turbine. As protons flow back down their gradient, it drives the production of ATP. It's like a hydroelectric dam using the flow of water to generate power. Amazing. But what happens if there isn't enough oxygen available? 
Can cells still make energy? That's a great question, and it's exactly what we'll be exploring in the next part of our deep dive. Stay tuned. You're right. That is a great question. And while oxygen is the preferred electron acceptor for most organisms, life, well, it finds a way. Cells mm -hmm. have developed these, like, backup mechanisms to generate ATP when oxygen is scarce, you know, or even completely absent. So what do they do? These alternative pathways. Well, they're called fermentation and anaerobic respiration. Fermentation. Okay, now that's a word I've heard before. That's what makes bread rise. Yeah. Right? It gives yogurt its tang and, of course, brewing beer. But how does it actually work, like, inside a cell? Both fermentation and anaerobic respiration, they actually use glycolysis to generate ATP. And remember, glycolysis itself doesn't need oxygen. But it does need a steady supply of NAD plus to keep going. Right, because NAD plus picks up electrons from glucose during glycolysis. Mm -hmm. But if there's no oxygen to keep the electron transport chain running, how does NAD plus get regenerated? Well, that's where fermentation takes a different path. Instead of sending those electrons to the electron transport chain, NADH, which is the reduced form of NAD plus NA, donates its electrons to an organic molecule, mm. something like pyruvate or a derivative of pyruvate. It's like finding a temporary storage spot for those electrons. It's like a detour on the electron highway. Sure. So what happens because of these um, alternative electron handoffs, the textbook mentions different types of fermentation. Yeah, there are a lot of variations actually, but two of the most common types are alcohol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. In alcohol fermentation, pyruvate is converted into ethanol and releases CO2 in the process. Uh, so that's what gives us those like bubbly pockets of carbon dioxide in drinks like beer and champagne. It is, and it's also what makes bread dough rise. Okay, so I'm guessing lactic acid fermentation is what makes yogurt, you know, tangy. Yeah, exactly. In this type of fermentation, pyruvate is converted into lactate, also known as lactic acid. And it's not just for yogurt. Oh, right. Yeah, our own muscle cells use lactic acid fermentation when we're exercising intensely. So when our oxygen demand is higher than what's available. Right. Ah, uh, okay, so it's like our muscles' quick energy source when they're working really hard. But lactic acid buildup also causes soreness, right? Like, how does our body get rid of it after a really tough workout? As your muscles recover, they slowly break down that lactic acid. It's either converted back to pyruvate or used as fuel for other processes. Eventually, things go back to a balanced state. Makes sense. But I'm guessing fermentation isn't as efficient as aerobic respiration, right? I mean, in terms of ATP production. You're right. Fermentation only produces two ATP per glucose molecule. Hmm. Aerobic respiration, on the other hand, can make up to 32 ATP. Wow, that's a big difference. It is. And that's because the energy stored in pyruvate doesn't get fully used. It's basically locked away in the end product of fermentation, like ethanol or lactate. So it's like fermentation is a quick burst of energy, like a sprint, while aerobic respiration is more like a marathon runner, steadily making ATP over a longer period of time. That's a good way to put it. Thanks. Okay, what about anaerobic respiration? Ah, yes. Let's talk about that. It's a bit less common, but definitely just as interesting. Some prokaryotes, those are single-celled organisms. They live in oxygen-free environments, places like deep sea vents or the guts of animals, and they use this pathway. Interesting, so no oxygen there. Right, and it's similar to aerobic respiration in that it uses an electron transport chain. So those electrons still cascade down, but they just end up at a different spot, like a different pool at the bottom of the waterfall. Exactly. Instead of oxygen being the final electron acceptor, they use other molecules that really want those electrons. Okay. For example, some marine bacteria use sulfate ions, and as a byproduct, they produce hydrogen sulfide. That's actually what gives those environments that, you know, rotten egg smell. Wow. So life really can adapt to pretty much anything, huh? I mean, it, it's amazing that organisms can generate energy even in the toughest conditions. Mm. But why would they choose these less efficient pathways when there's oxygen available? Well, it comes down to evolutionary history and, you know, how organisms have adapted to their environment. Many organisms that do well in low oxygen environments, they've evolved to use these pathways because oxygen isn't always there. It's about survival, you know? Like having a backup generator when the power goes out. That makes sense. Going back to fermentation for a minute, I'm curious about its practical applications. I mean, beyond food and drinks. Oh, there are tons of applications. Fermentation is used in biotechnology, industry, you name it. Like what? Well, for instance, it's used to make biofuels, medicines, even biodegradable plastics. Scientists are always looking for new ways to use fermentation, especially for a more sustainable future. That's really cool. So we've talked about what these alternative energy pathways are and how they work, 
I mean, what does it all mean for us, like practically speaking? Understanding these pathways helps us understand so much about biology. You know, it's everything from how food and drinks are made to like, the limits of what athletes can do. It even helps us understand things like hibernation and certain diseases. Hibernation. Yeah. The textbook mentioned brown fat, which is a type of tissue that generates heat by uncoupling ATP production from the electron transport chain, which is really important for mammals that hibernate so they can stay warm in the winter. Right. I was reading a study that connected being exposed to cold temperatures with increased brown fat activity in humans. Like It's almost like having a built-in heater. And even in humans, brown fat helps regulate our body temperature. There's even research now suggesting that activating brown fat could be a way to fight obesity and diabetes. That's fascinating. It seems like the more we learn about cellular respiration, the more we realize how it connects to so many aspects of health and disease. It really does. It shows us that these tiny processes inside our cells at a molecular level, they have huge effects on our overall well-being. Absolutely. Okay, so we've explored how cells generate ATP both with and without oxygen. We've seen how efficient aerobic respiration is, how fermentation is like a quick fix, and how anaerobic respiration allows life to adapt. Right, but remember, it's not all about breaking down glucose. Cellular respiration is linked to other metabolic pathways too. It's like a central hub in the cell's metabolic network. It is. And it's not just catabolism or breaking things down. It's also about andalism, the process of building things up. Right. And that's exactly what we'll explore in the final part of our deep dive. We'll uncover the flexibility of cellular respiration and its role in biosynthesis. Sounds good. Can't wait. Welcome back to our deep dive into cellular respiration. So we've seen how cells can make ATP with and without oxygen, but it turns out cellular respiration isn't just about breaking things down. That's a great point. It's not just about catabolism. It's also closely tied to enabolism, which is all about building things up. It's like a two-way street, you know, yeah. providing both the energy and the building blocks that cells need for all sorts of things. So it's not just a demolition crew. It's also a construction crew. The textbook mentions that our bodies can use more than just glucose for fuel. We can also use fats and proteins, right? You got it. And fats are a super efficient energy source. A gram of fat actually has more than double the calories of a gram of carbs. That explains a lot. Yeah. But how do fats actually get broken down and used in cellular respiration? Well, first, fats are broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. Glycerol can go straight into glycolysis. Fatty acids go through a process called beta oxidation, which breaks them down into two carbon pieces that can enter the citric acid cycle as acetyl-CoA. So it's like feeding the metabolic furnace with different kinds of fuel. Mm. And what about proteins? Where do they fit in? Proteins can be used for energy too, but first they need to be broken down into their building blocks, amino acids. Some amino acids are used to make new proteins, but any extra can be turned into intermediates that can enter glycolysis or the citric acid cycle. It's incredible how adaptable our bodies are. We can use different fuel sources depending on what we have available. But you mentioned anabolism, that building up process. Can you tell me more about that? Of course. Anabolic pathways use those intermediates from glycolysis and the citric acid cycle to make all sorts of essential molecules. Mm. We're talking things like amino acids to build proteins, nucleotides for DNA and RNA, lipids for cell membranes. It's really quite remarkable. So it's a very versatile system. Cellular respiration isn't just providing the energy the cell needs to function. It's also supplying the materials to build essential components. But with all of these pathways working together, how does the cell make sure everything runs smoothly? Regulation is key. The cell uses all kinds of feedback mechanisms to control how fast both the catabolic and anabolic pathways are working. To make sure energy production and biosynthesis are in balance? Right. The textbook mentions an enzyme called phosphofructokinase. It's a key regulator in glycolysis. It's almost like the pacemaker of the whole process, right? Exactly. Phosphofructokinase is allosterically regulated. That means its activity can be changed depending on what molecules bind to it. For example, high levels of ATP, which means the cell has a lot of energy, will actually inhibit phosphofructokinase, slowing down glycolysis. On the other hand, high levels of AMP, which is a sign that energy is low, will activate the enzyme, speeding up glycolysis. That makes perfect sense. Like a thermostat that adjusts the rate of energy production based on the cell's needs. It's amazing. It is a pretty brilliant system, you know. As we wrap up our deep dive into cellular respiration, I'm just really struck by how complex and efficient it all is. I agree. It really highlights the power of evolution and how ingenious nature can be. 
what we think of as like the simple concept of food being turned into energy is really a symphony of interconnected pathways working in perfect harmony to maintain life. It's incredible to think that all of this is happening inside every cell in our bodies all the time. Thanks to you, I have a much deeper appreciation for what's going on inside of us. It's been my pleasure. Remember, cellular respiration is fundamental to biology. Understanding it helps us appreciate just how connected all living things are. That's a great point. Thanks for joining us on this incredible journey through the inner workings of our cells. Until next time, keep exploring.